this is Tim with Morial TV and Morial Radio here with James Jacob Prash live via Skype in England. Jacob, one of the believers had the question based on Hebrews chapter 5 verse 8. If Jesus was truly God, how could he have learned obedience? Thank you for your question. We have to understand what it says about Jesus in Hebrews 5. Let's read the verse very, very carefully. And notice how Jesus is identified. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. Although he was a son, he learned from that which he suffered. To understand this, we have to understand the issue of theodicy. Theodicy. God lowers himself and puts himself in the position of an ordinary man. The key to interpreting and understanding this issue, most simply stated in the New Testament, is found in Philippians. It's found in Philippians. And we read the following concerning the Lord Jesus. Although he was in the form of God, he did not equate equality with God a thing to be grasped, but took the form of a servant. Jesus limited himself and subjected himself to what we are. He became like us, minus the fallen nature. He was the last Adam. Adam was a man who did not originally have original sin. Well, so Jesus was like Adam. He had no sin. But otherwise, he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. Even though he had no sin, he came to take ours in order to give us his righteousness. He did nothing wrong, but he took the guilt and responsibility for our sin in order to give us his righteousness. As we've said before, Jesus could have walked on the water because he was God, but didn't. He did it because his Father empowered him to. Jesus could have fed the 5,000 because he was God, but he didn't. He did it by the power of the Holy Spirit from his Father. He could have healed anybody and everybody, but he only healed the ones his Father told him to. He subjected himself to human limitations. He became like us in all functional respects, minus the fallen nature. That's what he did. In order to save us, he had to become like us. Satan tried to tempt Jesus in Matthew 4 and in Luke 4 to use his divine powers out of concert with his Father. Jesus refused. That's what Satan was trying to do, to get Jesus act outside of the harmony within the triunity of the Godhead. He refused. He was a man who was fully human and fully divine, but his divinity did him no functional good. Again, I've explained this before by comparing it to Mark Twain's docufiction and the Walt Disney film based on it, The Prince and the Pauper, about Edward VI. Once he found the twin to take his place, he temporarily uh, absconded uh, from his throne. Uh, in the meantime, his father dies and he becomes the king of England. But it was almost an absentia. He went out and he became like a poor boy in the slums of, of London, no longer living in Hampton Palace. He was impoverished. He was like any other person. Even though he was the Prince of Wales, even though he was to be king, he was functionally, nothing but another boy. He had no more power than any of the other ones. Well, that's the way Jesus was. He learned obedience as an example and a role model to us. And he learned it through suffering as a role model to us. It's not talking about his deity. It's talking about his humanity. He's 100% God, but 100% man. When he was here, he was a human being like you and I. The fact that he was God did not count functionally. Did not count functionally. He did not use his divine powers even though he could have. He had to learn it the same as we learned it. And he learned it 
again, as an example to us. This is called theodicy. Theodicy. God temporarily reducing himself to our level. Now, another passage, other than Philippians, that deals with this is found in Hebrews chapter 1. Christology of Hebrews chapter 1. We read the following. This is a problem, of course, with the Jehovah's Witnesses in verse 5. For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you? The Jehovah's Witnesses say he was an angel, Michael. And again, I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. And he again brings the firstborn into the world and says, Let the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, Who makes his angels winds, and his ministers a flame of fire? But of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever, and the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed, that's Christon, related to the word for Messiah, <coughs> anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. And the Lord in the beginning laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain, and they will all become like an old garment and like a mantle. Like a garment, they will also be changed. But you are the same. Your, ear, your years will not come to an end. But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? Speaks of angelic ministry. All of this is focused on the eternal deity of Christ. But look at how it is prefaced. Verse 3. And he is the radiance of his glory, the exact representation of his nature. He's God. And upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels. He has inherited more excellent name than they. Look what it says. It is only when, only when, he made purification of sins. He had to become what we are. He had to lower himself as a sacrifice. He had to go to the cross in obedience to the will of his Father. Then, then, we see his exaltation. He's eternally God. He reduces himself to our level to bring salvation, and then God exalts him. When he's reduced to our level is when he learns that obedience. We have to look at the entire context of Hebrews, and we have to look at the entire subject of theodicy to answer the question. He became what we are and temporarily subjected himself to our limitations. I hope this is clear. Thank you for your question. My name is Jacob Prash. God bless. Dear friends, greetings in Jesus. This is your friend Jacob Prash speaking to you at the moment from the UK. You know, so many of the questions we get in our Roku broadcast and our Vimeo clips and on YouTube deal with subjects that we deal with much more extensively in our books. We can't, for the sake of brevity, uh, go into the kind of depth in a TV broadcast we can actually go into in a book. But so many of the questions come from material that are expounded in the books on a much more broader scale that it's almost frustrating sometimes that we can't spend hours and hours answering the questions that, that are given to us. Obviously, practicality dictates that's not a possibility. The books are there. They're available. They're available in print through the Moriel catalog on the Moriel website, moriel.org. But in this day of Kindle and electronic books, they're also available through Amazon and they're available through Kindle. Kindle. The three books that would be the most referred to 
in the questions we receive are the three latest books. The first being The Dilemma of Laodicea. The Dilemma of Laodicea is an exposition of the seven churches in Revelation, culminating with the final two churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea particularly, setting the stage for the return of Jesus. The Dilemma of Laodicea would be the first. The second would be Shadows of the Beast. Shadows of the Beast. How the coming Antichrist, how his identity will be revealed to the faithful church. The rapture will not happen, will not happen, absolutely not happen, until the faithful church knows who the ultimate beast of Revelation is. That is the Antichrist and also the false prophet. How the identity of the coming Antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church, Shadows of the Beast, the second book, and the final and latest one, Harpezo, Harpezo, what the scripture actually teaches about the rapture, the snatching away which takes place between the sixth and seventh seals in the book of Revelation. So these three books, The Blum of Laodicea, Shadows of the Beast, and Harpezo, all available on the Morio catalog, all available through Amazon, and all easily available electronically by Kendall. Thank you so much, dear friends. God bless. May Jesus be with you.